Rub up your engines! Beth W says, should I buy my Honda at lease end? I got six months left on my 2021 CRV lease. I've had trouble with the heating system and this past summer the AC stopped working. There was a recall for AC compressor shaft leak. Tried to get the dealer to replace it, but they don't seem too interested in doing it until they have more time to look at the entire heating and cooling system. Today's the first day I'd driven in bad weather. It was horrible. It wouldn't defrost the window. Do you think it's worth buying at the end of the lease? Should I move? Uh, don't buy it at the end. When the lease is up, get rid of it. As I've said in numerous videos, Honda three decades ago was neck and neck with Toyota making one and two of the best cars in the world, right? Last decade, Honda's taken a steep nosedive down with their quality. And I wouldn't advise somebody with one that's had problems like that. I've seen some of the power steering goes out. I got a customer with one the power steering's out, and they're not going to get parts until April. The new V6 engines, a lot of them have bad bearings in them, and the engines could blow up. I would walk from that and get a Toyota next time, and you probably won't get any of these problems. The CRVs used to be phenomenal vehicles. I had customers that had 500,000 miles on them when I was in Houston, right? They're not what they used to be. They just unfortunately are not. Honda's taking a nosedive and hey, when the lease is up, get rid of the stupid thing. You've leased, you got six months left on your lease, right? And it doesn't work and they're not willing to fix the stupid thing now because you're leasing it. They're not making any money. They have to fix it for free because it's a lease car, right? So when something like that does happen, then you're kind of screwed because, oh, well, we're not really interested. We can wait to fix it. Hey, you lease that car, they should fix the stupid thing. If I were you, I'd even have a lawyer look at what your ramifications are. You could probably legally say it's unsafe. My window's fogging up. Here it is. Fix it and give me a rental car because it's a lease, right? And believe me, if you get a lawyer involved, they'll usually do that. They'll go fix it and they'll give you a rental car while they're fixing it. Barack says, Scotty, what do you think of those Tesla drives in Chicago? They can't drive because the battery's depleting the cold and it's Tesla super charging stations are not working. Well, uh, don't say I didn't tell you so because I told you so. Electric cars in cold weather don't go together. It's kind of funny because the batteries that are in electric cars are kind of like human beings. I just did a little research on it. It turns out they work best from the mid 60s Fahrenheit to the mid 70s Fahrenheit, just like us. We don't like to be too cold. We don't like to be too hot. And the batteries are exactly the same. They don't work that well in the cold. And then when you got to charge them up. Charging systems don't work that good when it's really cold. The cables get stiff. The connectors don't work. The computers don't operate correctly. Realize this is one of the biggest stinkers about charging an electric car outside. The charging systems are sitting outside and that's a big deal because they're out in the freezing cold and no electronic machine works outside that well in the freezing cold. That's just the way electronic things are. I've tried to use vending machines when they're in the cold and they don't work right. Planning your whole infrastructure on having an electric charging machine in the freezing cold with snow and everything ice on it, of course they're not going to work. Plus, they don't maintain them all that well. And the real stinker of it is the range of electric cars is an absolute lie for the real world. They lose 25 to 50 percent in the really cold weather. And in those supercharging stations, they generally People will charge their car from like 10, 20 percent to 80 percent. So right there, you're losing 30 to 40 percent because it takes too long to go from 80 percent to 100 percent. So you have to stop all the time. I just read about a guy who got a cyber truck. He went on a 1,400 mile trip and he had to stop like 12 times to recharge it because of the lack of mileage that those things can go, especially when it gets colder outside. So anybody that thinks Battery electric cars are good in the cold is insane. I don't know, 23 says, Scotty, my 2013 GMC Sierra, 1500, 236,000 original engine tranny. When I'm in a city and come to a stop, the truck clunks second to fourth gear. What could it be? First thing you want to check is jack it up, check the drive shaft. I've got a video how to check your drive shaft up. Grab the drive shaft. If you can go clunka clunka, the U joints are gone, you need to replace them. It could be that simple. Now, if the drive shafts don't go clunka clunka and the joints are good, that means your transmission is starting to wear out. And that's no surprise. You got a Sierra 1500 with 236,000 miles. That's, from my experience, generally the end lifespan. A lot of them will break at 153,000 miles of transmissions. You can get remanufactured ones and if they're remanufactured correctly, they can go another 150,000 miles or your case, 236,000 miles if you want to keep the vehicle. Pray it's the joints, but if it isn't the U joints, that just means your transmission's starting to go out. When they clunk, they're going out. There's nothing else that does that other than the U joint. If they shift poorly, you could have a bad shift solenoid, but when they clunk, that has nothing to do with the solenoids. That means 
lights, it's wearing out internally. Wyatt from Canada says, what might cause my headlights to dim when I turn the steering wheel when I'm stopped? If you're stopped and the headlights aren't dim and then you turn the wheel and they start to get dim, odds are you've got a late model car because late model cars have electronic power steering. Back in the old day, they had mechanical hydraulic pumps, right? And that isn't going to make your headlights dim because it's just a mechanical belt. But if you've got a modern car, most of them have electronic power steering and they use a reasonable amount of power to run that motor when you turn the steering wheel. It can make your headlights dim. Have your battery and alternator load tested because let's say your alternator's weak. When you turn the wheel at idle, electric power assist motor has to use more electricity and if your alternator isn't putting out enough, it'll make your headlights dim too. So you're actually better off if it's your alternator wearing out because alternators are a lot cheaper than replacing the power steering assembly on an electronic power system. Trey says, Scotty, I got an 04 Elantra, 80,000 miles. You think it'll last a long time? I've taken good care of it. Okay, I'm not really a fan of Elantras, but yours is 20 years old and it's only got 80,000 miles. I've seen those things go 150 and they're still doing okay. I personally would not buy one, but you have it and it's been good. I had a guy in Houston who was a salesman. He put 250 on his, but he did all kinds of driving. He put 100,000 miles a year in the car. He was like a rep for a big grocery chain in the Southwest. He drove all over the place, so his mileage was all highway mileage. Zeke says, I have a 96 Lincoln Town Car. I disconnect the battery at night. Could this hurt the computer? Not on that old thing right? It's a 96. It's pretty simple. You wouldn't want to do that on a modern car because the modern cars, everything is run by a computer and some of them have like 37, 47 separate computer modules and they reset when you disconnect the battery, the car won't auto, right? Sometimes the windows won't roll up, right? You'll have all kinds of problems. But on an old thing like that, I'm assuming you have some kind of an electrical problem that drains the battery. People have been doing that for years. They make battery terminals you can put on they'd have a master disconnect switch. So rather than take it apart, you can just turn the switch off and then when you start it, turn the switch back on. A lot of guys will do that. Gucci's Eye says, it's a Volvo S40, 2.5 liter, head gasket replacement, easy job or harder than most engines. Well, actually it's an easier job because that's a straight engine. It's not a V where you gotta take two heads off. It's only got one head and it's actually not all that bad. I did one years ago. I don't know, it took me four or five hours. It wasn't that bad of a deal. I was shocked at how that vehicle was relative easy to work on. And there's usually enough room that you can take the intake and the exhaust off and leave them hanging on the car, especially the exhaust, and then you can just take the head, get it fixed, put it back down with a new gasket, and then bolt it back on. They're actually somewhat easy to work on. Don Murphy says, Scotty, my car burns a lot of oil. Now blue smoke comes out. What could that mean? Okay, but no, he spelled no wrong, K-N-O-W instead of N-O. No blue smoke comes out, but it burns a lot of oil. Blue smoke is when it's really burning oil like mad, and blue is a combination of burning oil and burning metal, meaning the piston rings themselves are burning, and the inside of the engine's actually burning, and it means you're kind of getting near the end before the engine's going to just fall apart completely. That's what that means. The blue smoke means, yeah, you're burning metal, but some cars can still last years if it's not too bad. Change the PCV valve. If it's stuck open, you'll suck raw oil in and it'll burn a lot of oil. But if you're really curious, pull out a couple spark plugs. See how bad they're followed with carbon. And if they're really followed with carbon, it's just burning and your engine's on its last legs. But if you want to keep driving and it keeps running, what the heck? I had a customer in Houston, changed the spark plugs every six months and kept driving it. It had run poorly after put another, and it went four years that way. It was still running. So what the heck? Three twenty-four says, what was it with your wife's mats? Why does it have a carpet in the middle? Okay, those are very fancy mats. What you're looking at is an underlayment and it fits both in the back seat over the hump and then in the front seat over where the gear shift is. And I love them because they look nice. The original cars have those cheap rugs, right? And then you put a mat on top of the rug. Well, these are beautiful underlayments in the case of the ones that you're looking at. They're made out of leather. They're really nice. And then the actual mats snap on top of it. So you can take them out and clean them and put them back in. I especially like it because I got my wife's Lexus. And there I loved it because the previous owner sometime moved a battery in the car. They spilled battery acid and it ate up some of the old Lexus car. It's a beautiful looking car. It had this ugly spot, right? Well, when they sent me those carpets, that thought great. It covers up all the old rug with the spots. Looks beautiful and the mats fit on it. And that's what it is. And hey, if anybody's ever in the back seat or the front seat with bare feet, they appreciate it because it's padded and it's really comfortable. So 
So they're not cheap. They're super expensive mats. Give you that. They're expensive. But they look nice and they're very comfortable. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.